Brief lecture today on Margaret Olivia Little's The Moral Permissibility of Abortion, as well as Sidney Callahan's A Case for Pro-Life Feminism, is brought, brought to you from the country here in the Corn Tassel community near my hometown of Vaughnwood. So first of all, Callahan, she continues Thompson's argument, Judith Jarvis Thompson's argument, that even if unborn developing humans enjoy a right to life, even if we grant them the status of full humanity or personhood, and we say they have a right to life, this doesn't generate an obligation to do anything and everything to continue that life. And, of course, Thompson established this through her famous violinist argument uh, and some other examples and such. Um, uh, Littles. Hi, Bruno. How are you? Bruno. Bruno. Say, Bruno. Neighbor's dog, Bruno. Uh, what what uh, Little does is she builds on Thompson's argument. There he goes. <laughs> I love you too, Bruno. Yeah, I love you too. Um, <laughs> uh, what Little does is she continues uh, Thompson's argument by emphasizing the fact that pregnancy has many burdens. It can be very burdensome. It can be medically risky. It can be physically burdensome. And it's also the case that uh, pregnancy will fundamentally change the identity of the woman. She says that over the course of pregnancy, it's not only the case that a group of cells will eventually become, if allowed to, to, uh, to develop and flourish and such, a baby, but also a woman will become a mother. And this is going to impact that mother's character. It's going to impact her, her uh, priorities. It's going to impact her personality. It's going to change her body physically for the rest of her life, regardless of whether or not she gives up that ultimate baby to uh, for adoption. And so she wants to emphasize all those various burdens. I mean, it's also the case that a pregnancy can keep you entangled in a, uh, an unsavory relationship that you might want to otherwise dissolve. It can make you an outcast in your family. Lots of different bad things can come about um, that she just doesn't want us to neglect and make light of or ignore. And at the same time, she wants to emphasize the fact that even though there are, are two entities here, even though there's the potential mother and there's the UDH, and they're both respect worthy, she doesn't want to grant that UDHs are respect worthy, it's the case that the UDH is dependent upon the mother in a way that is not experienced ever, anywhere else. And so she says that sometimes people will say that abortion is akin to um, the killing of another adult. So if I were to, to see a neighbor out here and stab him with a knife and kill him, my goodness, what a terrible example. Um, but if I were to do that, that would be very different from um, Little herself having an abortion because my neighbors and I are distinct and independent adults. And it's the case that uh, they don't rely on me for their life or for their nurturance, their continued existence. Whereas an unborn developing human does. It's the case that the unborn developing human would not exist but for that mother's support, but for her egg. And it would not continue to develop. That's not a very friendly looking dog, is it? Hello, dog. It would not continue to develop but for without the mother's continued support. And so she wants to say that it's not like regular cases of, a, of murder. It can't be equated with that because... Um, the dependency there and the fact that the UDH wouldn't exist at all without the mother. Now, sometimes people argue that if a person engages in voluntary, unprotected sex and they become pregnant as a result of that behavior, they knew they could have become pregnant. And so perhaps this generates an obligation to maintain the pregnancy due to their recklessness and their carelessness. Little wants to say that no doubt when people engage in unprotected reckless sex, and especially with partners to whom they have no uh, commitment and have no interest in, in continuing a relationship, um, that's definitely morally uh, condemnable. That's something that uh, we could argue that a person ought not engage in because it would seem to neglect the importance of the moral status of uh, procreation. It would seem to treat that very flippantly. But she says we should disentangle the ethics of sex from the ethics of gestation. She wants to argue that just because a pregnancy is the result of voluntary, casual, unprotected sex, even though we, we could say that that, the, that heterosexual couple uh, ought not have done that, that doesn't generate an obligation to necessarily maintain the pregnancy. And she wants to say that, in fact, all pregnancies, or I'm sorry, all, all abortions are permissible. She, she continues Thompson's line that or her distinction between uh, justice and decency. She wants to argue that no abortions are unjust, although some 
are indecent. And she gives the example of an abortion that's sought to fit in a party dress. That's the example she gives. But she also gives some other examples that show and emphasize this moral gray area between moral permissibility and obligation. She gives the example of marriage. Somebody wants to marry you, and if you were to do this, it would make them very happy, it would make your family very happy. It would be nice of you to do this, but you have no obligation, no strong obligation to actually go through with it. You don't have to get married because of that. But somebody really wants you to. She gives the example of a soldier who's going off to war, and uh, he's a virgin, and he wants to have sex before he goes to war. She says, this might be a very nice thing of you to do, if you have a, a certain ethic about uh, sexual permissibility and such. But it's not something you have an obligation to do. Further, she says, if there is a soldier on, a, on the battlefield and a, uh, a grenade falls in the foxhole with the soldier and several other soldiers, the soldier, soldier would have no moral obligation to jump on the grenade and save his, his or her comrades. It would be praiseworthy were the soldier to do so. And if the soldier were to refuse to do so because he or she wanted his or her fellow soldiers to die, we would say they are indecent. But that still doesn't mean they have an obligation to jump on the grenade. And she wants to say the same thing is true about abortion. Although they can be indecent, so they're never unjust. And so abortions are sometimes indecent, never unjust, and always permissible. So that's a little. All right, Callahan's A Case for Pro-Life Feminism. Usually people associate feminism with a pro-choice perspective, with the defense of a woman's right to have uh, ready access to abortion for pretty much any reason uh, without very many restrictions. Callahan wants to argue that this, this perspective and this approach is very inconsistent with the foundational values of the feminist movement and of feminism. And those foundational, foundational values would be equality and empathy. She says women want to argue that they should be treated equally with men. At the same time, they want to emphasize empathy for the weak and the vulnerable. And she argues that when you are a, a strong advocate of a pro-choice position from a feminist perspective, what you're doing is treating this vulnerable entity as if it is a piece of property. And you're also exercising your, your power indifference the power dis disparity that you enjoy over the UDH in being able to terminate its existence and end its development. And she argues that women have, have complained quite rightly against men who in the past have treated them as if they are property and who have used their power imbalance to dominate and treat them very poorly. And when feminists then do the same thing to an unborn developing human in the name of empowering women, this is very much inconsistent with the foundational values and, and uh, therefore a logical, logically bad thing and, and a morally bad thing. She wants to argue that in many cases, feminists will say that it's necessary to have abortion to promote the autonomy of women. They need to be able to make decisions about whether or not they're pregnant. They need to be able to, to pursue their life plans, to pursue education, career opportunities. They need to be able to express themselves sexually on equal footing with men. They need to be able to, to have sex without worrying about becoming pregnant, just as men do. And to be able to, to uh, be promoted in the workplace and per, per, pursue different positions and careers and such without the worry of having a uh, nine-month layoff prevented them from becoming promoted and such. But Callahan just wants to say that um, when, you, when you go down this road, it, it's not going to be good for women. This ma masculiniz masculinization of sex, which promotes the um, objectification of sex, uh, promotes the casualness of sex, the um, uh, lack of commitment, commitment between partners, it leads to infidelity, it leads to divorce, leads to fatherly irresponsibility. She wants to argue that, on the other hand, the true feminist paradigm would emphasize monogamy, it would emphasize commitment, chastity, responsibility, and this would lead to respect for women. This would lead to the uh, shared responsibility of potential parents. You know, this would lead to stronger commitments from men and greater, greater fulfillment for both, both sides, both men and women. And so um, she also throws in a little argument from uh, the Rawlsian perspective. Remember Rawls's Veil of Ignorance, the original position. She says sometimes fem feminists will say that if we were behind the Veil of Ignorance, we would, of course, choose a world in which abortion was readily available. Because if uh, the veil is lifted and we're a woman, we would not want to be forced to maintain an unwanted pregnancy. 
But Callahan says, look, if you're really behind the veil of ignorance, you need to not only consider the perspective of women, but the perspective of unborn developing humans. And if you're behind the veil and you're asking yourself, well, what would I want? What would be in my interest? How do I want to promote my rational interest in case I happen to be an unborn developing human? Well, she wants to argue that, well, then, if that's the case, you would certainly argue against wide accessibility and easy access to abortion because you yourself could be a UDH subject determination. So there you go, Margaret Olivia Little and uh, Sydney Callahan, two very interesting arguments. Look forward to your thoughts.